Hi everyone, this is the solutions to the standard maths 2 HSC exam from 2019. In this video I'm going to go through the solutions to the multiple choice questions. Okay, nice easy one to begin with. Which of the following shapes has a perimeter of 12 centimetres? All we've got to do is add up the lengths around the shape and we don't have to get very far because it's actually A. 4 plus 2 is 6 and 4 is 10 and 2 is 12. Make sure you take your time and don't rush these questions. Question 2. Sugar is sold in four different sized packets, which is the best buy? So what we've got to do is compare each of these. And I'm just going to pick the first two and compare those and then knock one out. So this is 100 grams and this one's 500 grams. So I'm going to multiply A by 5 to make it an equivalent weight. So 0.4 times 5 is $2. $2, $1.65, B is cheaper so we can eliminate A. Now I'm going to compare these two. Okay, 500 grams and 1 kilogram, let's double B. So $1.65 times 2 is $3.30. We'll compare $3.30 to $3.50, B is cheaper, so let's knock C out. And then finally, compare 500 grams, B, and 2 kilograms, I need to multiply B by 4. So I can actually just double that one if I want to, or do $1.65 times 4, we get $6.60, and B is still cheaper, and so B is the answer. Question 3. Chris opens a bank account and deposits $1,000 into it. Interest is paid at 3.5% per annum, compounding annually. Assuming no further deposits or withdrawals are made, what will be the balance in the account at the end of two years? All right, most important thing with compound interest is to look for how often it's compounded, which is nice. It's annual, so we don't need to divide by 12 to get monthly or divide by 4 to get quarterly. Okay, it's just a straight question. Here's our formula. The future value is equal to the present value, which is 1,000, 1 plus r to the power of n. So we just got to substitute into the formula. I've done the quick version. You don't have to. You can do 1 plus 3.5%. And it's at the end of two years. We're just going to put it into the calculator and we get $1,071.23, which is B. Question 4. Which compass bearing is the same as a true bearing of 110 degrees? So the best idea with this question is to draw a quick sketch. So there's 110 degrees there. Now remember with compass bearings, we're going to either go from north or south first, then towards east or west. So this line here is closest to south so we're going to go from south a certain angle and then east so all we've got to do really is figure out what this angle is that's 180 take off 110 makes this one 70 so it's going to be south 70 degrees east which is c question five utc of auckland is plus 12 hours and utc of chicago is minus five hours when the time in Chicago is 2 p.m. Thursday, what is the time in Auckland? So it's another diagram question. So let's draw it out so we understand what's going on. Here's Chicago. It's five hours behind London, or Greenwich Mean Time. And Auckland is 12 hours ahead. So between Chicago and Auckland is 17 hours. All right, we know that in Chicago it's 2 p.m. on Thursday. What time is it in Auckland? We need to add 17 hours to that. Now we can already see that that's going to go over to the next day. There's lots of different ways to do this. You can use your calculator, use your fingers. It doesn't really matter. Here's one way of doing it. Instead of the 5 and the 12 here, I know that I need 10 hours to get to midnight. So I'm going to change this into 10 plus 7. See, it's still the same. 5 plus 12 is 17. 10 plus 7 is 17. But this is midnight here. And that tells me it's going to be 7 a.m. the next day. So our answer is D, 7 a.m. Friday. Question 6. Mary is 18 years old and has just purchased comprehensive motor vehicle insurance. The following excesses apply to claims for at-fault motor vehicle accidents. There's a basic excess of 850 for every claim. Then there's an additional age excess of 1600 for drivers under 25 years of age. And there's an additional age excess of $400 for drivers 25 years of age or over with no more than two years driving experience. How much would Mary be required to pay as an excess 
if she made a claim as the driver at fault in a car accident. All right, mostly it's the literacy in this question that's the problem. You've got to be able to understand the difference between these three and apply them to Mary. All right, she's going to pay that basic excess of 850, so it's not going to be A. It's either going to be B, C or D. Now, there's an additional age excess if she's under 25, which she is. Okay, so it's either going to be now C or D. Does she have to pay this one as well? Additional age excess of $400 for drivers 25 years of age or over. She's not over 25 and it's nothing to do with the no more than two years driving experience. So she's only going to pay this one and this one. So our answer is C. Question 7. Julia earns $28 per hour. Her hourly pay rate increases by 2%. How much will she earn for a four hour shift with this increase? Okay, so all we've got to do here, it's a nice easy percentages question, is increase this $28 by 2% and then multiply it by four. So this is the quick way of increasing by percentage. You can do it the long way if you want to. This is one plus 2%. If you do it the other way, you do 2% of 28 and then add the 28 on. But either way, you get $28.56. And now we just need to multiply that by 4. So our answer is D, $114.24. Question 8. A person's weight is measured as 79.3 kilograms. What is the absolute error of this measurement? All right, these sorts of questions students don't typically like, so let's see if we can make it a little bit easier to understand. So we've got this formula on the formula sheet, but it's not particularly useful. The absolute error is a half multiplied by the precision. Now the precision is referring to what this is rounded to. Because remember this is a continuous measurement. Okay, before it was rounded it went on forever. It could have been 79.2865 blah 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 blah. It's been rounded to one decimal place. So the precision is 0.1. It's the smallest unit you can put in that position. So our absolute error is 0.5 or a half multiplied by 0.1, the smallest unit. It's in kilograms. So let's multiply that out. It gives us 0 0.05 of a kilogram, but there's an added complication. We want it in grams. So let's multiply that by 1,000. It gives us 50 grams, which is the answer B. Question 9. What is the interest earned in dollars if $800 is invested for X months at a simple interest rate of 3% per annum? Okay, so we're not given the formula for simple interest. It's a nice easy one to remember. It's I equals PRM or PRT. doesn't really matter. And the only trick with it is, is that R and N have to be the same. They're either both in years or both in months. Let's have a look how we do it. So P, the principal, is $800. The interest rate is 3% or 0 0.03. And you can see I've decided to do it annually or in years. So I've had to turn this into a proportion of a year. You could put the divide by 12 under here if you wanted to. Do 800 times 0 0.03 time divided by 12 gives us 2. And so our answer is 2x. Question 10. School collected data related to the reasons given by students for arriving late. The Pareto chart shows the data collected. What percentage of students gave the reason train or bus delay? So remember with the Pareto chart, we've got a column graph, which relates to this axis. And then we've got a cumulative frequency graph, which relates to this axis. Now, given it's in percentages, or we want a percentage, it's probably easiest to do the cumulative percentage and work it out from there. Remember, this is a running total, so we're adding on each time. So all we've got to do is figure out how much has been added on from that point for train or bus delay this point. So it's just a matter of reading off here. So this here is at 86 and this point here is at 92. 92 take away 86 is 6% and that's our answer. Question 11. Which of the following correctly expresses y as the subject of the formula 3x take 4y take 1 equals 0? Okay so we're rearranging the formula. So we'll start with the original formula. Now I want to get y as the subject. So the way that I always do this is I try and avoid these negatives. And I'm going to take 
the, the subject or the thing that I want to the side that makes it positive. So I'm going to start by bringing that over here like that. It, it stops confusion at the end with negatives if you do that. All right, now I'm going to flip it around. And the last thing I have to do is divide by 4. So it's actually quite an easy question when you do it that way. The answer is C. Question 12. This question cracked me up. An owl is 7 metres above the ground in a tree. The owl sees a mouse on the ground and gets out its theodolite and measures the angle of depression as 32 degrees. How far must the owl fly in a straight line to catch the mouse, assuming the mouse does not move and assuming the owl has a calculator? Right, we're going to draw a diagram. So first thing we've got to do, angle of depression, remember it's that one that's always tricky. So it's this angle here, it's from where the owl is looking straight out to where it's looking down. It's not this angle here, it's a common error. Also remember angle of depression is the same as the angle of elevation because of alternate angles. So let's put it down there. All right, we want to know how far the owl has to travel. So that's this distance here, so let's put a pro numeral. Okay, we're ready. So we're going to do some basic trig. So what have we got? Opposite and hypotenuse. So it's going to be sine. Sine 32 is 7 on x. So make sure you get that order correct. Opposite over hypotenuse. Do you remember what to do here? We switch these. The x comes up here. Sine 32 goes down the bottom. And then in the calculator, it gives us 13.2 metres, which is D. Question 13. The graphs show the future values over time of P dollars invested at three different rates of compound interest. Which of the following correctly identifies each graph? All right, let's see if we can have a go at this. So we've got two that are very close and then Y is significantly lower. We're just going to go through each one and see if we can eliminate. Let's have a look at this one to begin with. So W is 5% per annum compounded annually and X is 10% per annum compounded annually. Okay, this one's wrong, okay, because this is a higher interest rate. This one should be greater than this one, and it's not, it's lower, so it's not A. Okay, let's look at B. W is 5% compounded annually. X is 10% compounded quarterly. This one's wrong as well. This one should be higher. It should be even higher than that one because the more often you, you compound, the more interest you get. So B's out. Okay, let's look at C. 10% per annum compounded quarterly, 10% per annum compounded annually, 5% per annum compounded annually. This one's a possibility. So okay, let's just leave that one for a moment. Let's look at D. 10% per annum compounded annually, 10% per annum compounded quarterly. Ah, this one's back the front. So this one here should be higher. Okay, the more often you compound, the more money you get. So this one's wrong. D's wrong. And so our answer is C. Question 14. Last Saturday, Luke had 165 followers on social media and Reese had 537 followers. On average, Luke gains another three followers per day and Reese loses two followers per day. If X represents the number of days since last Saturday, Y represents the number of followers, which pair of equations models this situation? Okay, so this is a bit of a nasty question. It's really asking you if you, if you understand the difference between gradient and y-intercept. Because 165 and 537 are the vertical intercepts or the y-intercepts. It's the number of followers, followers that they have on day zero, on Saturday. Three and negative two are the gradients of the line. It's the rate of increase or decrease. You can see that because of this word per day. So remember y equals mx plus c. So you can see this one's wrong because they're saying that it's going up by 165 each day and it started with three. So A is out. D is also out, okay, because we've got the gradient in the wrong position. I know this is written as Y equals C plus MX, but you can see in front of the X is the gradient. So that one's wrong as well, which leaves us with these two. We can see the 165 and the 537 are correct, but we want negative 2X, and it's going to be this one here sort of a bit of an added layer of confusion because these ones this is written back the front but we can see it's not here because Reese doesn't start with negative 537 followers so our answer is B. Question 15. The scores on an examination are normally distributed with a mean of 70, 
and the standard deviation is 6. Michael received a score on the exam between the lower quartile and the upper quartile of the scores. Which shady region most accurately represents where Michael's score lies? All right, this is a bit of a nasty question to finish off with because it's mixing up upper and lower quartile standard deviation. They don't normally go together. Let's see if we can knock one of these out. So he's, his score lies between the upper and lower quartile. It can't be D, okay, because this is above the mean. So we're one down at least. Here, here, and here, they're very similar. We need some more information. On the formula sheet, we have this. Approximately 68% of scores have Z scores between negative one and one, or between one standard deviation of the mean. So 68% is gonna lie between 64 and 76. Have a look how I got that. I took six from the 70, gave me 64, and I added six to the 70, gave me 76. So that's this one here. So this is 68%, so it's not this one. Michael received a score between the lower quartile, which is at 25%, and the upper quartile, which is at 75%. So we want the middle 50%. All right, can you see which one it is? If this one's 68%, that's more, it's going to have to be this one here. So our answer is A.